This is chapter 12, Arts of Ritual and Daily Life. As we saw in chapter 2, our modern concept of art took shape during the 18th century. It was then that Europe, European philosophers separated painting, sculpture, and architecture from other kinds of skill making and placed them together with poetry and music in a new category called the fine arts. More than two centuries separated us from that moment, and over that time, the new grouping has come to seem natural to us, just a part of the way the world is. Yet in fact, the grouping is not natural, but cultural. In this chapter, we look at the context that art was lifted from, objects made with great skill and inventiveness, rewarding to contemplate and imbued with meaning. They were made to be touched, to be handled, to be used or worn in daily life or in ritual settings such as religious ceremonies. Because of that, they possess a special human intimacy. If we see them now in a museum, we know that they once were used by their owners, who took them into their lives. We begin by introducing a range of widely used media, clay, glass, metal, wood, fiber, ivory, jade, and lacquer. Illustrated with Western objects fashioned before our system of fine art arose, and with objects from cultures where that separation never occurred. We then look briefly at how Western thinking about these arts has changed and been challenged in the centuries since fine art was born. So when we think about this um, idea of this idea of what is craft, so we're looking at objects that are also considered to have a everyday use and function. Um, and we want to think about going back to the very first, um, like one of the very few first lectures on chapter two, about this idea of fine art and art versus craft. So the three main things we want to consider for chapter 12, the first is what is craft? The second, how is craft different from fine art? And the third, what are the different materials of craft objects? So thinking about this idea of what is craft, Traditional trades of the Middle Ages, such as pottery, glass blowing, blacksmithing, woodworking, and weaving, were considered a craft, or expert work done by hand. The specific connotation of craft is an object made by hand. During the Renaissance, during the 14th century, 14th and 17th century in Europe, painting, sculpture, and architecture were seen as different kinds of activities than carving a chair or foraging a wrought iron gate. Exploring artistic traditions beyond the West often challenges our categories of art and craft. Many different cultures attribute the kind of meaning most Westerners associate with art, with objects such as textiles and basketry. The thing to consider is how is craft different from fine art? Another common assumption of craft objects is that they are functional, unlike art objects. However, the line between what is craft and what is an art object is often subjective. What might help to distinguish the crafts from other arts is their, their emphasis on specific materials. Which brings us to the third thing to consider in chapter 12. What are the different materials of craft objects? The traditional materials of craft are clay, glass, metal, wood, fiber, jade, ivory, and lacquer. Most craft artists concentrate on one material only and have learned to realize its potential for many different kinds of expression. So really important to know for the upcoming final exam is your ability to know the different materials of craft objects, all right? So the traditional materials of craft, so for you to know this for the upcoming final exam. Um, the first uh, material we're gonna look at is clay. The craft of ceramics from the ancient Greek word ceramikos meaning of pottery involves making objects from clay and naturally occurring earth substance. When dry, clay has a powdery consistency. Mixed with water, it becomes plastic, moldable, and cohesive. This is a piece by the artist Betty Woodman. It's an Aztec vase number five. It's as the title, it is made in 2006 out of glazed earthenware, epoxy resin, lacquer, and paint, approximately 37 inches tall. Once a clay form has been built and permitted to dry, it will hold its shape, but it is very fragile. To ensure permanence, the form must be fired in a kiln at very high temperatures. Nearly every culture we know of has practiced the craft of ceramics, and civilizations in the Middle East understood the basic techniques as early as 5000 BCE. And this is an example um, of an artist that is crossing the boundary between craft and fine art. So she is making a traditionally, uh, she's making an object that is traditionally considered to be part of um, a process known as uh, ceramics, um, once classified to be a um, craft. 
but this is actually crossing over into the realm of fine art because she's actually displaying them in a fine art context. A major requirement for most ceramic objects is that they are hollow and that they have thin walls around a hollow core. There are two reasons for this. The first is that many ceramic wares are meant to contain things like liquids or foods. The second is that a solid clay piece is difficult to fire and may very well explode in the kiln. There are different forms for forming um, a hollow core in the ceramics. Uh, the first is slab construction. When a ceramicist rolls the clay into a sheet, similar to rolling out dough for a pie crust. The sheet of clay can be handled in many ways. It can be rolled, cut into shaped pieces, draped over objects, etc. Then there's coiling, where the ceramicist rolls out rope-like strands of clay and then coils them upon one another and joins them together. The vessel made from coils attached to top of the other will have a rigid surface, but the coils can be smoothed completely to produce a uniform flat surface. The native peoples of the southwestern United States made extraordinarily large, finely shaped pots by coiling. During the 20th century, the tradition was revived by a few supremely talented individuals, including the famous Pueblo potter Maria Martinez, who we see here. Martinez worked with the local red clay of New Mexico. The distinctive black tonalities for finished pots were produced by the firing process. After building, smoothing, and air drying her pots, Martinez laboriously burnished them to a sheen with a smooth stone. Next, a design was painted on with slip, which is liquid clay. The pot was then fired. Partway through the firing, the flames were smothered and the pot blackened in the resulting smoke. Areas painted with slip remained matte or dull, while burnished areas took on a high gloss. So here's another piece um, made by a different artist, just titled Magdalene, um, it's titled Untitled by the artist Magdalene Odundo, made in 2001. It's polished and carbonized terracotta, approximately 23 and a half inches tall. In uh, utilizing ceramics is utilizing a potter's wheel. This is the fastest method for creating a hollow form. The ceramicist enters, centers a mound of clay on the wheel and as the wheel turns, uses hands to open and lift the clay form. Throwing in a wheel always produces rounded and cylindrical forms. The Chinese vase that we see here is a flask made between the years of 1425 and 1435. It's porcelain with blue underglaze, approximately 18 feet tall. Was thrown on a wheel by a specialist at one of the great ceramic centers of Imperial China, where thousands of workers produce ceramics on an industrial scale using assembly line methods. The vase is made of porcelain, and porcelain is a mixture of white clay called kaolin and a feldspar quartz called pentus. When fired at high temperatures, the porcelain produces a translucent white glass-like ceramic that is much stronger than it looks. The secret of porcelain was discovered and perfected in China, and for hundreds of years, potters tried without success to duplicate it. In 1710, European potters stumbled upon the secret. Even today, the word for the finest pottery is the same as the country that invented it, China. The next um, material um, to be considered part of this um, so-called so craft um, designation is glass. If clay is one of the most versatile craft materials, glass is perhaps the most fascinating. Although there are thousands of formulas for glass, its principal ingredient is silica or sand. The addition of other materials can affect color, melting point, strength, etc. This is um, a piece by the artist Dale Chihuly, who works with glass as a primary material. It is titled Persian Chandelier. It's approximately 94 inches by 118 inches by 112 inches, in installed in the Royal Botanic Gardens in the United Kingdom, um, made in 2004. When heated glass becomes molten, and in that state, it, it can be shaped by several different methods. Unlike clay, glass never changes chemically when it cools. As glass cools, and, as glass cools it hardens, and it can be heated again for further workings. Glass as a material holds many risks both during the creative process and afterwards. The shaping of a glass object demands split-second timing, quick decisions, and quick handiwork. In addition, a finished glass piece is the most fragile of all craft wares. Stained glass is a special branch of glass craft. 
It is a technique used for windows, lampshades, and similar structures that allow light to pass through. Stained glass is made by cutting sheets of glass in various colors into small pieces, and then fitting the pieces together to form a pattern. Often the segments of colored glass are joined together by strips of lead. The 12th and the 13th centuries in Europe were a golden age for stained glass. Light was viewed as a spiritually transforming substance. This is an example of a stained glass window in the Chartres Cathedral. It is um, titled The Tree of Jesse in the West Facade. I found on the west facade of the Chartres Cathedral in France, made between the years of 1150 and 1170, out of stained glass. The soaring interiors of the new cathedrals were illuminated by hundreds of jewel-like windows, as the one illustrated here from the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Chartres, France. The central motif is a branching tree that portrays the royal lineage of Mary, Mother of Jesus. The tree springs from the loins of the biblical patriarch Jesse, depicted asleep at the base of the window, growing upward and it enthrones the four kings of Judea, then Mary, and then Jesus himself. So thinking about um, this idea of light as a spiritually transforming substance, um, we're going to see this again echoed within our chapter 13 um, architecture when we look at the construction of many um, cathedrals and churches during this period of time. Glass is commonly shaped by blowing, a technique that dates from the Roman times. To blow glass, an artist dips a portion of molten glass at the end of a long pipe. By blowing through the opposite end of the pipe, it produces a glass bubble that can be shaped by various methods when still hot. And that is the method that Dale Chihuly utilized here in his Persian chandelier by blowing glass and then shaping it um, when it is still hot. The next um, craft material is metal. Metal is the most indestructible craft material. Metal can be shaped by heating it to a liquid state and pouring it into a mold, which is considered casting or forging. This is um, Made by the brothers Filippo and Francisco Negroli, it's a burgeonet of Charles V, made in 15, 1545 out of steel and gold, um, and it is an example of forging. Forging involves heating a chunk of metal over a fire until it is red hot, and then beating and shaping it with hammers. This method is how horseshoes traditionally were made, and it is the method for making wrought iron as for balconies and railings. So this, um, this. This helmet was also was cast, but then it was also forged as well. The next example is wood. Wood is another example of a craft material. So some great things about wood as a material is that it is relatively cheap to work with. The simplest tools will shape it, and wood as a material is so widely available. The drawbacks are that it is not very durable, cold and heat distort it, and water rots it, and insects can eat it away. This is an example of a piece that was made utilizing wood. It is a functional object. It is the chair of a Teferis in Egypt, Dynasty IV, um, made between the years of 1575 to 1551 of BCE out of gold and gold leaf. Wood and gold leaf. The most common product of the woodworker's art is furniture. The basic forms of furniture are ancient, and the chair dates back to 1600 BCE. The basic forms of furniture are surprisingly ancient. The chair, for example, seems to have been developed in Egypt at around 2600 BCE. Massive thrones for rulers and humble stools for ordinary people had existed earlier, but the idea of a portable seat with a back and armrest was an innovation. Miraculously preserved by the dry desert climate of Egypt, this chair, one of the oldest known, shows that artistic attention was lavished on furniture from the very beginning. The chair's legs are carved at the legs and paws of a lion, an emblem of royal power. Within the open frames of the armrests are carved bouquets of papyrus flowers, a symbol of lower Egypt. I also want to think about a more contemporary example is this Ames um, lounger with ottoman that I showed you um, earlier in a previous chapter, um, designed by the artist duo Charles and Ray Ames out of molded um, molded uh, wood, so they pioneered um, a lot of contemporary mid-century modern furniture design as well, also utilizing the craft material, craft material of wood.
The next example is fiber. The design possibilities for works utilizing fiber are enormous. Fiber is a narrow strand of vegetable or animal material, either cotton, linen, wool, or silk, or the modern-day synthetic equivalents. Like wood, fiber is widely available and quite perishable, but the construction methods used for fiber are unique to this material. The ancient Incas, whose civilization flourished in the mountains of Peru during the 15th century, held textiles in such high regard that they draped gold and silver statues of their deities with fine cloth offerings. Textiles were also accepted as payment for taxes, for they were considered a form of wealth. Standardized patterns and colors on Incan tunics instantly signaled the wearer's ethnicity and social status. Woven at around 1500, the fascinating royal tunic we see here is a virtual catalog of such patterns although scholars have not yet succeeded in identifying them all. The black and white checkboard pattern, for example, represents the Inca military uniform in miniature. By wearing this tunic, the king visually declared his dominance over all of Incan society. So it's a tunic from Peru, made in 1500 out of wool and cotton, approximately 35 and 7 eighths of an inch by 30 inches. Tapestry is a special type of weaving in which the yarns are manipulated freely to form a pattern or design on the front of the fabric. Tapestry weaving experienced a golden age in Europe in the late 17th through in the late 14th through 17th centuries. For those who could afford it, tapestries were the art of choice. This is a um, one of a series of uh, tapestries. Um, it is titled The Unicorn in Captivity from the Hunt of the Unicorn Tapestries. It's southern ne Netherlandish made between the years of 1475 and 1500 out of wool warp, wool, silk, silver, and gilt wefts, approximately 12 feet, 8 feet, and 3 inches. The history of tapestries, but instead have focused a great deal of aesthetic attention on carpets and rugs. So we see here one of um, the most famous Islamic textiles. Um, it's one of, um, and what we're seeing now is one of a pair of um, very famous rugs um, known as the Artable Carpets. Um, like most Islamic carpets, they are created by knotting individual tufts of wool onto a woven ground. The labor was minute and time consuming. The London Artable Carpet has over 300 knots per square inch or over 12 million knots in all. The design features a central sunburst medallion with 16 radiating pendants. Two mosque, lam mosque lamps, one larger than the other, extend from the medallion as well. Quarter segments of the medallion design appear in corners of the rug. These elements seem to float over a deep blue ground, densely patterned with flowers, making the carpet a sort of stylized garden. Paradise in Islam is m imagined as a garden, and as such, flower-strewn carpets represent a luxurious, domesticated reminder of this ideal world to come. In the United States, one of the most popular textile arts is quilting. Quilting has a strong social component, for it is often furnished a regular occasion for women to spend an evening together telling stories, sharing their lives. Quilting has a special relationship to the African American community, for quilts made by slaves and former slaves during the 19th century are preserved in museums today. One example of this is the Bible quilt by the artist Harriet Powers, made in 1898. It's made of pieces that are appliqued and printed cotton embroidered with plain and metallic yarns, um, approximately 5 feet, 83 and 7 eighths of an inch, by 8 feet and 9 and 1 eighths of an inch. The next uh, material is ivory, jade, and lacquer. Jade and lacquer have long histories as craft media, although not in the West. Jade is a common name for two minerals, nephrite and jadeite, ranging in color from white through shades of brown and green. Two stones are found principally in East and Central Asia and Central America. This is a standing figure holding a supernatural effigy. It's part of the Olmec culture and made between the years 800 and 500 BCE out of carved jade. It is approximately 11 inches and 11 by 3 eighths of an inch tall. Ivory was treasured not only by cultures that obtained it through trade, but also by cultures for whom elephants were a living presence. Many African cultures associated elephants symbolically with rulers, for they were seen to be mighty, wise, and long-lived. This is an arm ornament um, created in Yoruba in the 16th century. Um, it's out of carved ivory, approximately 5 and 11 eighteenths of an inch by 4 and 1 eighth of an inch by 4 and 1 eighth of an inch. Thinking about this idea of ivory, 
um, in the Yoruba city of Owe in present-day Nigeria, only the king or title chiefs would have been permitted to wear the armlet that we see here. Carved from a single piece of ivory, it consisted of two interlocking cylinders. The inner cylinder is finely pierced in an airy openwork pattern and punctuated by human heads carved in high relief. They may represent people over whom the wearer had power. The outer cylinder of the cuff, which can shift slightly to the left or right, depicts kneeling hunchbacks, monkeys on leashes, and interlocking circles of crocodiles, biting the heads of mudfish. Hunchbacks were associated with the deity Obatla, who had fashioned human bodies. He is said to have created hunchbacks while drunk, and he is thus their patron. Crocodiles and mudfish were royal symbols that linked rulers to Okulun, the deity of the sea who brought wealth and fertility. Scholars have suggested that such richly symbolic ornaments were worn at the festival of Ose, which celebrated the origins of the Yoruba civilization. Lacquer is a material specific to East Asia, for it is made of the sap of a tree that originally only grew in China. Harvested, purified, colored with dyes, and brushed in thin coats on wood, the sap hardened into a smooth glass-like coating. Thirty coats of lacquer are needed to build up a substantial layer, and each must dry before the next layer can be applied. Knowledge of lacquer spread early from China to Korea and Japan, as did cultivation of the sap-producing tree. Asian artists developed a variety of techniques for decorating lacquerware. In China, a favorite method was to apply layer after layer of red lacquer, building up a surface thick enough to be carved in relief. Trays, boxes, and even entire pieces of furniture were produced in carved lacquer. In Japan, artists perfected the technique of inlay, creating designs by sitting materials such as ivory, mother of pearl, and silver into the lacquer ground. And this is a writing box, um, which we see the inlay of mother of pearl in lacquer on wood. Um, it's by the artist Jitoku Akazuka, and it's titled Writing Box, entitled Dancing Cranes, made in 1921. Artisans used lacquer to create trays, bowls, storage jars, and other wares that were lightweight, delicate looking, yet water resistant and airtight. So thinking about the use of lacquer was to create um, trays, bowls, storage jars, and other wares that were um, water resistant and airtight for the main purposes of holding liquids and foods, so perishable items. Beginning in the 1960s, some artists also began bringing the materials and techniques of crafts into art. This trend was started by potters. Clay, after all, had long led a double life, used at once for sculpture and also for ceramics. The first wave of feminism during the 1970s prompted a still broader and more profound consideration of the categories of art and craft. Early feminist artists were angered by a gallery and museum system that overwhelmingly favored male artists and by a standard account of art history in which women artists played virtually no role. And this is a piece titled The Dinner Party by the artist Judy Chicago, made in 1979 out of mixed media. And here we see ceramic plates um, and also custom table settings for um, important women throughout culture. And so this is a table setting we see right here for the author Virginia Woolf. So there are many um, table settings, and this is an aerial view of the uh, table for the dinner party. It's a large-scale installation with sculptural wares that were made out of ceramics, and also textiles that were um, that also utilized uh, craft um, techniques, such as embroidery, which we see here. Early feminist artists sought to create art that was specifically female, art rooted in the social and historical experience of women. The artist Faith Ringgold draws on the tradition of textiles to link her own inner city childhood to the larger African American experience. This is a, a painting by the artist Faith Ringgold. It is titled Tar Beach from 1988. It's an acrylic paint on canvas bordered with printed, painted, quilted, and piece cloth, approximately six feet and two inches by five feet and nine inches. So some questions to think about, can a painting be made out of fabric? And can quilts exist? as art and also be non-functional objects. So this is something to think about in terms of, you know, quilts are normally thought of as functional objects and quilting is relies on the um, medium of textiles, right? So thinking about how Faith Ringgold blurred the boundaries of craft and art by making her large scale paintings, which also incorporate an element of 
quilting and textiles into them as well. Um, an exa another example is the artist Ellen Atsui, who transforms trash and the materials of poverty in into something opulent. So questions to think about, can a sculpture be draped and can a textile exist out of metal? In works that we see here, titled Sasa by Ellen Atsui, a contemporary Ghanaian artist, he takes his formal inspiration from textiles, though the material he works with is not fiber but metal. Sasa is made of bottle caps and small food tins, such as star sardine cans, flattened and then stitched together with copper wire. It recycles materials imported into Africa, goods that flow from wealthier places into a poor continent. In its visual splendor, Sasa draws on the tradition of African royal textiles, such as kente. Kente, too, was an art of recycling, for it was originally made of silk fabric imported from China. So this is a piece um, made out of um, flattened food tins um, and, then, um, and then stitched together with copper wire. The textile itself is approximately 21 feet by 27 feet and 6 inches. The artist Josiah McKinley uses the reflective properties of mirrored glass to draw a connection to reflecting on philosophical ideas. This is a piece titled Extended Landscape Model for a Total Reflective Abstraction from 2004 consists of a mirrored glass platform with hand-blown mirrored glass objects. The title of Josiah McKinley's Extended Landscape Model for Total Reflected Abstraction suggests that we are looking at something we might someday be realized on a far, on a far larger scale, as an installation that we could wander through, perhaps, or even a city with futuristic architecture. Both images are plausible, for the artist's inspiration for the work came from a conversation that took place in 1929 between the sculptor Isamo Noguchi and the visionary architect and designer Buckminster Fuller. The two men considered the possibility of creating a sculptural form that would cast no shadows. They agreed that such a form would have to be perfectly reflective and placed in a reflective environment. Noguchi put this proposal into practice by creating a chrome-plated sculpture of Buckminster Fuller's head and setting it in the middle of a room painted entirely in reflective silver paint. The portrait sculpture survived, but the original reflective setting is long gone. Intrigued by the story, the artist Josiah McKinley set out to realize the idea again to see what it might mean today. He blew glass replicas of forms that Noguchi used in his works, silvered their inner surfaces so that they became mirrors, then arranged them on a mirrored platform. McKinley has suggested that contemplating non-representational reflective objects is similar to reflecting on abstract ideas such as philosophical ideas. He has said that one of the things his reflective glassworks are about is the idea of utopias, visions of perfected societies. Seductive in their rational beauty and their promise of a better world, utopias quickly became oppressive when put into practice. Perhaps they are best contemplated as models for something that should never be built. Indeed, as viewers, we are bound to intrude on the perfection of extended landscape model for total reflective abstraction, interrupting its surfaces with our own reflections, scattered, distorted, shadow, and all too human. As we have seen, um, we think about this idea of artists that utilize the, um, the, the materials and methods of um, traditional craft and incorporate them into fine art. So I'm thinking about how this definition of what is art and what is craft is not only cultural, but it is also contextual as well. For your homework, please read chapter 13, her chapter on architecture, and watch the accompanying lecture video. Please also make sure to review for the final exam and use the study guide that is found in Blackboard.